America. It's a beacon to the rest of the world. And not just for our system of government, but for how it makes people feel inside. America. I just love the country and the people. I love America because I'm free. Tell me what you love about America. Everything. The founders didn't write the Constitution and the Bill of Rights with all this bravado and confidence. They wrote those documents in fear. They had come or their families had from places where people they knew were hung for speaking up for their rights. Reading the Constitution, there were moments where I really felt the presence of, you know, the fragility and the beauty that was in that original dream of this country being founded in this way, and that incredible hope that went into those documents, and the incredible, I almost felt around me the protection that those documents give me and my children, you know, very personally. And then I felt them threatened. America and our friends will meet this threat with every method at our disposal. FBI, police, open up! A new report says the president and his advisors are still making anti-terrorism policy on the fly. Police in Washington, D.C. have put in place an army of surveillance cameras. There was a request from the White House as to the possibility of replacing all the United States attorneys. Well, we don't torture people. No, let me say that again to you. We don't torture people. Preventing mass terror will be the responsibilities of presidents far into the future. I've always been a writer, and I write about politics and social issues. Naomi Wolf is the author of several books, including the 90s feminist classic, The Beauty Myth. What's your name? And I love that I live in a country where I can express my views without fear. But I wrote The End of America because I saw that changing. Best-selling author Naomi Wolf's latest book is called The End of America. My guest is Naomi Wolf. She is an enemy combatant. Preparing George years. Bush to Hitler is what I'm pretty good. It's off the deep end. We're done. That's all we got. Naomi Wolf. I started having conversations around the country, talking with people at town meetings. Thank you. One dimension, which is very popular to say. The state is legalizing torture. Uh, this is a, becoming a police state. We count it out. Terrorist attacks. Yeah. It's a yeah. I'm, I'm actually familiar with some. Oh, geez, yeah. And you know what really has to happen in this country's real debate has to go back to the citizens. Traveling around America to warn people of this threat, I felt so strongly how each of us has a role to play in standing up for the Constitution. And I was really moved at how people from every walk of life wanted to stand up and fight. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about some very disturbing warning signs that we have to pay attention to and rise up to confront. I wrote this book in a, in a, in a kind of desperate heat and haste uh, last year because of an emergency I saw that we were facing. I have this friend. She and I often talk about news events together. And we would talk about the Bush administration and things that were happening, and she kept saying, <clears throat> they did this in Germany. They did this in Germany. And at first, really, 
I have to tell you, I thought that this was crazy talk, you know, so extreme and so out there, and, right? And I really dismissed it. And she didn't drop it. She kept saying they did this in Germany. Finally, she sat me down, and she put a stack of books in front of me, and she pretty much said, read. And I started to read. And as I read, uh, literally, my hair stood on end because sound bites and images and phrases were leaping off the pages and were current in the discourse around us. E little echoes from things like Homeland, the Department of Homeland Security. It used to be called domestic security, right? Homeland, Heimat, is a word that became current in National Socialist discourse in about 1931-32. The National Socialists pioneered the practice of unloading the war dead off of trains in the darkness of night so people wouldn't know the extent of the war dead. The media couldn't take pictures. This administration has also unloaded the war dead from Iraq off the planes in the middle of the night, a departure from practice. Black water, uh, there was a paramilitary organization called Schwarzwasser. <laughs> And I realized from my reading that intently, strategically, systematically, a small group of people set out to undermine the Constitution, opening the door for the horror to come. And so what became so clear to me from my reading is that Germany in those years wouldn't have looked so different from today. I mean, we you know, tend to think, oh, Nazi Germany, you know, it's like a Lenny Riefenstahl film. But in fact, Germany in 1930, 31, 32 had gay rights organizations and human rights organizations and feminist organizations. It had celebrities. It had all kinds of newspapers, all kinds of debate, all kinds of dissent. It was a modern state. I didn't stop with Germany. I started to read about Stalin's Russia and Mussolini's Italy. East Germany in the 50s. Czechoslovakia in the 60s, Pinochet's coup in Chile in 73, and the Chinese crackdown on the democracy protesters at the end of the 80s. Same things recur again and again and again. Little subversions of people's rights, little constitutional changes. And I saw that the great dictators learn from one another what was essentially a blueprint for closing down an open society. And then it became clear to me that this blueprint is simple. It consists of 10 steps, 10 clear steps. And then what became so chillingly clear to me is that these 10 steps are in place in the United States today. Fear is the most devastating of all the threats we can have in a democracy. The language of fear will cause ordinary, decent people to do things that's not in their character. The first thing is to invoke a terrifying internal and external threat. And sometimes it's a real threat. After 9-11, the Bush administration used a terrible crime against our nation to launch what it called a, quote, war on terror, end quote. Other countries that were hit by the same bad guys went after the terrorists while still protecting the rights of their citizens. But the Bush team raised Americans' fear level as high as possible. We will discover and destroy sleeper cells. The government says because the 19 hijackers got into the country legally, investigators want to know if more terrorists have slipped in the same way. Right after 9-11, the government created the Department of Homeland Security. And one of the first things it did was literally to create a way to manipulate the levels of our fear. 
this is not uncommon. I wouldn't be so sure that the war on terror is real, but is also a hyped threat, right? Y yellow, orange, red. Who does this? Who's really fighting terrorism? Does Israel do this? You know, they really have terrorists. And they don't say, it's an orange day, you know? <laughs> Oops, it's red. You know, they're out there quietly trying to find these guys and prevent these attacks, right? And they take pride in not frightening the citizens in having daily life go on without fear. Let me remind you of uh, how did the National Socialists come to power? In Berlin in 1933, the German parliamentary building, the Reichstag, was set on fire. Many historians say this was a staged attack, but it was a terrible shock to people's sense of security. The National Socialists seized on this to pass laws to subvert the German Constitution. So they said, you're not patriotic unless you pass Clause 2 and later the Enabling Acts. It means the state can open your mail. It means the state can listen to your phone calls. It means that you as parliament give up much of your authority to the leader. And so that legal process prepared the way for everything that followed. We see now in our own country legal maneuvers that undercut our civil liberties. By October 2001, the White House drove the USA Patriot Act through Congress. The Patriot Act is over 300 pages long. It weighed as much as a baby. It was printed at 3 in the morning and they had to vote on it by 11 a.m. The Patriot Act gave the government access to wiretapping you, electronically surveilling you, researching your medical records, looking at your bank records, looking at your credit card statements, even looking at the books you checked out of the library, all without you ever having done anything wrong and all without a warrant. Today we take an essential step in defeating terrorism while protecting the constitutional rights of all Americans. Congress passed a new law called the Uniting and Strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct Terrorism Act of 2001. The Patriot Act. <laughs> sure is the axis of evil for bad acronyms. The Patriot Act really opened the door for what followed. The administration used the cover of fighting terrorism to greatly expand intrusive federal law enforcement powers. Our war on terror begins with al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. They scared us by invoking the greatest threats of all, the weapons of mass destruction, and a false nuclear threat. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. Remember the drumbeat, war in Iraq, war in Iraq, we've got to invade, we've got to invade. Remember the yellow cake, thank you, in Niger. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Iraq has sent agents to Niger, and they are buying yellow cake, which is used in nuclear bombs, so that, as Condoleezza Rice put it memorably, we cannot wait for the smoking gun to come in the form of a mushroom cloud. This scared me. Did it scare you? No? Well, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> but this was completely fake. And up and down, we now know, up and down the State Department, we're like, fake, fake, don't do it, don't do it. But they hyped this threat. This government does not torture people. We don't torture people. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. We don't torture people. Waterboarding. We do not. I don't it's talk torture. about techniques, and we don't torture people. Now listen to now listen to me. I want you to listen to me. The second thing that always happens in a closing society is to create a secret prison system outside the rule of law, where torture takes place. And by secret, I mean unaccountable. Now, the White House has said for years, America doesn't torture. We know now that America tortures, tortures grievously. But now we know categorically that the torture was directed from the top. Everything from directives to hang prisoners by their hands from the ceiling, electrodes on genitals, 
threats against family members, extremes of heat and cold, forced nakedness. These are tactics taken right from the gulag. And we know there are black sites around the world where people are simply disappeared. The secret prisons and Guantanamo became settings where US agents tortured prisoners. The administration defended torture as being necessary to save American lives. I wake up on November 14th, 2001, and I read in the Times that the president has issued what's called military order number one. And it is an order of the presidents that he issues as the commander in chief, essentially says that the president can pick up any non-citizen anywhere in the world who the president thinks might be involved in terrorism. The hunt is on. Yellow. Their enemy combatants and terrorists who are being detained for acts of war against our country. And that is why different rules have to apply. When people are unpopular, vilified, painted as devil, and that's when rights get swept aside. So the administration sought to redefine torture. John Yu wrote a memo in 2002 that was a semantics game, a really evil semantics game that sought to redefine torture narrowly to just two criteria. One was organ failure, and the other was that severe pain and suffering must be inflicted with specific intent. And anything less than that did not, according to this memo, constitute torture. Okay, look, you wrote a, you contributed to the writing of the 2002 memo, is that right? Yes, sir. The memo was implemented at some point, is that right? What do you mean by implemented, sir? What I mean by implemented is the guidance that was set forth in that legal memorandum was followed and put into action. Do you understand what I mean by implemented now, sir? So you're asking me, was the I memo just told followed? You. Was the memo followed by... I'm not going to get into semantical games with you in this five minutes. I need you to answer the question or refuse to. The Army had for decades a manual on interrogation. It approved 16 appro methods of interrogation. Rumsfeld then directed to expand the 16 methods of interrogation to 35, and that started our downfall. I don't see people kind of bringing the nation to a halt in protest against what's being done to these detainees. And even decent people say that they can't get that worked up about it. I mean, these people are represented as the worst of the worst. So quite apart from the morality of the torture of prisoners in our custody, quite apart from the fact that the Constitution forbids cruel and unusual punishment, quite apart from the fact, the fact that it's against the law, US law as well as international law. So why should we care that brown people with Muslim names are being tortured? We should care for our own sakes because of the record of history. When you look at Germany, you see this clear pattern. In 1930, 31, 32, torture was still illegal in Germany, but the SA, these informal paramilitary groups, would drag people out of halls like this one if they asked a confrontational question and take them to these makeshift torture cellars. And one of the early parts of the Hitler regime was really to pick up people and put them into essentially concentration camps. And instead of calling that torture, which is what was going on, they called what they did to people enhanced interrogation techniques. That term is precisely the term that the United States government uses about the way it treats people at US detention camps. After the great wars of recent history, America established laws that protected the right of prisoners more and more securely. While Rumsfeld was pushing for these abusive interrogation methods for the military to use, the military felt honor-bound and they were actually legally bound to obey the Geneva Conventions. And under the Geneva Conventions, torture can be used under absolutely no circumstances whatsoever. If you look at it pragmatically, does torture work?
Does it do what you want to do, which is to save innocent life? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Waterboarding is the same thing that Saddam Hussein did when he was head of Iraq. It basically didn't work and it was illegal and worse, it provided information that was completely wrong. You know, even the justification for invading Iraq, for, for killing hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, was based on a lie, it was based on a, a false confession obtained through torture. We use it as a justification to topple a regime, to invade a country, to kill hundreds of thousands of people. This is not the last war that America is going to fight. What we do today is creating a precedent for how American prisoners of war, who are not yet born, will be treated in the future. In 2006, Congress passed the appalling Military Commissions Act, which stripped detainees of many rights to a trial and allowed many kinds of brutality. It expands the definition of an enemy combatant and gives the president the power to detain them indefinitely. When Congress passed the Military Commissions Act, it was really a slap in the face of the founders because they fought for any accused to have the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. This bill spells out specific, recognizable offenses that would be considered crimes in the handling of detainees. So what the Military Commissions Act does is, in a stroke, it strips the detainees of the right to challenge their own detention and treatment, or even see the evidence against them. If that person is going to be tried, they're not going to be tried in front of a regular court like we're familiar with, but in front of a special court called the Military Commission. They can be done in secrecy, evidence from torture can be used at a death penalty, Essentially, a person could be tried and executed without anybody in this country knowing about them, and the whole thing could happen in an aircraft carrier. The military tribunals are kangaroo courts, modeled after Stalin's show trials and Hitler's people's courts, where similarly the accused couldn't hear the evidence against them. In an open society of due process, right, that means that they have to be able to accuse you of something that you've done. In a closed society, your innocence doesn't protect you. Most chillingly, the Military Commissions Act expanded the definition of enemy combatant to include any innocent U.S. citizen. Right now, the President of the United States, any president, any president to come, can say to any one of us sitting here, anyone out on the street, you're an enemy combatant. And because the president has said so, that makes you one. And they can't torture you yet, but they will make it difficult for you to talk to a lawyer, difficult for you to see your family, and psychiatrists know that prolonged isolation makes mentally healthy people insane. There's a point, and I know it, if I open the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, and I read that someone I identify with, a journalist, a commentator, has been named an enemy combatant and is in a 10 by 12 foot cell in a Navy brig. It's at that point I'm going to stop talking. That's my limit. Everyone has a limit. So that is why, apart from the ethics, apart from the morality, each of us should be appalled that the state is torturing detainees and prisoners in our names, even as we speak. We have difficult work to do in Iraq. We're doing important work there. We need protection for our diplomats. The third thing a would-be dictator always does is to create a paramilitary force that is not directed by the people. Any suggestions? Blackwater. 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 That's right. I mean, when I lie awake at night, out of all these things, this is the one that scares me most. 
Hey, all these fuckers right here. Blackwater is a paramilitary force headed by a guy, Eric Prince, with close ties to the White House. Eric Prince's family's wealth has contributed over $2.4 million to the Republican Party and its candidates. Blackwater alone has secured more than $500 million in federal security contracts since the year 2000. Two-thirds of those contracts are what is known as no bids. Who needs ammo? Most Americans don't know that Blackwater contractors are hand-picked torturers and murderers from countries that torture and murder their own civilians. Um, do you have any qualms about hiring people out of, out of Chile um, to participate actively in this, uh, in this war? Uh, I believe the, uh, the persons of that country have a, uh, a free right to contract. Now, most of us know that Blackwater is operating pretty much outside the rule of law by design in Iraq, and we know they murdered 17 civilians in cold blood. Having used security contractors in place of our soldiers and in a security capacity, we still haven't come down to the bottom line of how they will be held accountable. You do admit that Blackwater personnel have shot and killed innocent civilians, don't you? Uh, no, sir, I, I disagree with that. There could be ricochets, there are traffic accidents. Yes, they're, they're, this is war. Can you tell me what was an investigation ever conduct, conducted? Congressman, if you will, we will get back to you with full details. Are you refusing to answer? Is that... Congressman, I will have to check on that for you. We've had a better response from Blackwater than we have from the State Department on getting information. It's a question of, of when things go wrong, where is the accountability? When the FBI tried to investigate, the State Department blocked the investigation. Now, when the state starts to protect its own murderers, a very dangerous corner has been turned. I asked your Secretary of Defense a couple months ago what law governs their actions. Uh, Mr. I was going to ask him. Go ahead. <laughs> Help. Well, I was hoping... Blackwater is this horrific stealth threat to me because I have read history and I know what you can do even in a functioning democracy with a handful of paramilitary terrorizing people. For example, Mussolini, always the great innovator, started to bring Italy to its knees by using black shirts. He called them Arditi. They were veterans returning from the war and he would send them in a targeted way, go beat up that newspaper editor, go beat up this politician. And it's intimidating. And finally, there were scenes of when actual parliamentarians were getting threatened by these black shirts, they started to cave. And this prepared the way for Mussolini to triumph. And so, of course, Hitler knew something that worked when he saw it, so he deployed the brown shirts. So why is a paramilitary force so alarming? Why do we have the Fourth Amendment? The founders knew what it does to ordinary citizens to have a standing army that is directed not by the people, not accountable to the people. They made sure that the National Guard, our militias are answerable to the people. That's why they made sure that there's posse comitatus, which means that the, the police are a, a domestic force, a civilian force, that we don't have a, a military occupation of our streets, okay? And that's one of the things that makes the United States different from countries all over the world where they know the state can break in. Blackwater Worldwide's high-risk warrant hostage rescue course is designed to teach proven tactics on the most common situations. Many of us don't know that Blackwater is already operating in the United States. In New Orleans, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, Jeremy Scahill reports that there were, were contractors shooting at civilians in Katrina. I was in New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and I saw Blackwater mercenaries speeding up and down the streets in unmarked cars, heavily armed with M4 machine guns, flak jackets, other weapons strapped to their legs.
The nation's largest private security company may build a world-class training facility in Kootenai County. The Idaho Post Academy has signed a letter of intent to work with Blackwater if the company decides to build in the region. We feel Blackwater's reputation will hurt Idaho's reputation. This is the thing that keeps me awake nights out of all these steps. When I travel, people in, I'm in Chicago, people say, oh yeah, Blackwater just established a beachhead in Illinois at the mouth of the Mississippi River. I'm in Southern California, people in San Diego are like, yeah, we're just fighting this really hard fight because Blackwater wants to establish a presence along the border, getting into border control. And their business plan calls for them to be increasingly active, monitoring protests, their website, has a focus on Midtown Manhattan. A paramilitary force, you can't close down an open society without one. We've got a crisis, we're at war. The enemy is plotting to attack us. This proposal will allow us to gather intelligence information on that enemy that we otherwise would not get. Another sign of a closing society is when government starts to surveil ordinary citizens. Mussolini pioneered this. Hitler set up neighborhood spies. East Germany developed the Stasi. And China today has the Dangan system. You need a surveillance apparatus to close an open society. Most of us know that our emails can be read and our phone calls can be listened into. But most people, I would have to say quite naively think, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why does it matter? All you have to do is read history to know that in a closing society, you don't have to have done anything wrong. If there's a surveillance apparatus, they can listen in. And they, as other institutions erode, they can simply say you've done something wrong or use leverage through the surveillance to intimidate you. The Stasi, the secret police of East Germany, kept everyone in a state of fear and silence. For years, everyone thought they had a Stasi file on them. After the wall came down, it turned out that only 10% of people actually had a file on them. But all it takes is to know you're under surveillance to keep you scared and frightened. So this is one of the steps that I have a, a very personal relationship to, and I have a lot of feelings about it, um, for the following reason. For a year and a half, every time I would try to take a plane, I would get my boarding pass, and it would have a quadruple S high security threat mark on it. And they would take me out of the line and do that whole extra security check thing. And I kept asking, what's up with this? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And finally, this nice young TSA agent said, oh, you're on the list. <laughs> and I'm like, the list? I'm on the list? How was Nazi Germany able to round up so many Jews so quickly? Because they had mechanized the list. Again, how did Pinochet manage to round up mass arrests? Mass arrests are always a hallmark of a closing society. Thousands, tens of thousands of people in a notorious soccer stadium. The list. Every closing society keeps a list. So I researched it, and it turns out that I was in very good company. As of July of 2008, there are over 1 million Americans on the watch list. 20,000 names get added each month. 1 million entries. Now, there can't possibly be a million terrorists in the United States. We know, for example, there are lots of famous people on that list, don't belong in there, Senator Edward Kennedy, Nelson Mandela, peace activists, nuns, lots of people on the list. After doing some research, I discovered that I was in very good company. Many innocent, outspoken U.S. citizens are on the watch list. We understand that a new member is on the watch list, Drew Griffin of CNN. How did I get on this list? Well, the TSA is adamant it's not even me, even though it is me getting stopped at the airports. And my question is, why would Drew Griffin's name come on the watch list 
post his investigation of TSA. What is the basis of this sudden recognition that Drew Griffin is a terrorist? What a curious and interesting and troubling phenomenon. David Antoon, highly decorated Vietnam War veteran, served his country bravely, criticized the Iraq War. I mean, you can take WMDs and the Gulf of Tonkin, and you can see the manipulation of, of information to bring the American public into accepting and approving of a, of a war that really had no basis. So I started writing about that. It wasn't long thereafter, I noticed that every time I would purchase a ticket and board a flight, I would uh, receive boarding passes with four S's on them. Every time I travel, every time my children travel, every time my wife travels, um, every time my 86-year-old mother travels, they're all on the watch list. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's an inconvenience, but it's insulting. And so when you want to close down an open society, you keep everyone under surveillance so that people increasingly become too frightened to stand up and speak. To one of these meetings came a young FBI agent, bringing with him, concealed among groceries, a portable radio transmitter. The ties of blood that bind us to the German fatherland can never be broken. The fifth thing that always happens in a closing society is that there's increased infiltration of citizens groups and this is against the law. The ACLU has many documented cases of illegal infiltration of groups just like this and in fact there's probably someone here today. Hello! <laughs> you know, I hope your audio is working well. <laughs> In 2004, at the Republican National Convention, the New York police spied illegally on anti-war protesters. There were also reports that the FBI was illegally spying on other nonviolent groups of Americans, meeting in churches and in Quaker houses of worship. documents obtained by the ACLU reveal that undercover cops infiltrated local groups opposed to the death penalty and the war. The internal documents show that nearly three dozen times undercover state police officers covertly took part in protests like this one in November of 2005. Sports writer David Zirin was part of a group that successfully pushed for a moratorium on the death penalty in the state of Maryland. What he didn't know was that the state police had sent undercover agents to monitor this group of American citizens' legal activities. In the meetings was somebody who was known to us as Lucy. And Lucy would sit there, she was, the word that keeps coming to mind was uh, peppy. Like she would sit there with a big smile on her face and ask lots of questions and take notes. It was always the most basic questions, like, wow, why are we doing this? Why about, like, the kind of questions that you're happy that somebody who's new to a group asks. And he found out later that it was Lucy who was the spy. It's obvious that they made the conclusion that nothing illegal was going on here, and yet they continued to monitor our email list. They continued to come to our meetings. That's the thing that's so upsetting about this, is that this idea that some people deserve to be watched and some people don't. People should ask that question about, well, where is my homeland security uh, money going? Is it actually being used to keep us safer or is it being used to stifle dissent?
we know that when you go to your anti-war group or your environmental group, there may well be someone there, and this is right out of COINTELPRO. We did this in the 60s and 70s until there were laws against it. Congress took action. Those have been undone. Uh, but in your local group, there's going to be some really, think about that really troublesome person who's always trying to start a fight. <laughs> you know, this is a tactic to send uh, agents in who look and dress like ordinary citizens, activists, but who are there to cause trouble, to make it difficult to move forward, to break up the group, to smear people. Surveillance and infiltration, it's the way the state messes with people's minds to make them psychologically unwilling to stand up for themselves or even trust their own reality. It's a psychological pressure point and not just a tactical one. The Bush administration says a president's warfighting powers include authority to detain enemy combatants, even when they're U.S. citizens. The next thing is to arbitrarily detain and release citizens. And again, this is an intimidation tactic. Pinochet did it. Uh, the National Socialists did it. Do you guys remember James Yee? Chaplain James Yee, a U.S. citizen, was assigned to Guantanamo Bay. He dared to speak up against the mistreatment he saw there of the prisoners. I raised concerns about the abuses that were occurring, how specifically religion was being used as a weapon to try and break these individuals. And then a troubling incident occurred. Captain James Yee was arrested after he was caught with classified documents and diagrams. Chaplain James E. was returning from service in Guantanamo. As he got off the plane in Florida, he was detained. Much of what they were looking at were articles that I had printed off the internet. I had been enrolled in a master's degree program, and I was doing a research paper on the Syrian president. Most immediately thereafter, I was then accused of being a terrorist spy and thrown in prison. I was locked away in a single solitary cell in Charleston, South Carolina, the very same facility where the U.S. government holds what they term U.S. citizen enemy combatants. I was worried that they, I was going to be falsely convicted of these heinous crimes and then wrongfully put to death, whether by the electric chair or, 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 or some other means. James Yee was held in solitary confinement for 76 days. But now this guy is out of prison, and every time he crosses a border, they take him and hold him and release him. My life would be forever affected uh, by the, the constant surveillance that the American government puts on its US citizens. Software engineer. Maher Arar, a Canadian citizen, had been vacationing with his family in Tunisia. As they were flying home, he was taken at the airport and separated from them. I was pulled aside by immigration officials. They took my fingerprints, my photos. All of a sudden, FBI officials came and started interrogating me. He was stopped at JFK, pulled out of line, interrogated all day, and then taken to the Metropolitan Detention Center in New York. This father of two was held in solitary confinement for two weeks. He repeatedly asks for his attorney. He tells them he'll be tortured in Syria. He tells them he doesn't want to go to Syria. He was then taken via Jordan to Syria, where he is detained for a year. There was no light in there. It was three feet wide, six feet deep, and seven feet high. It was a torture chamber. He was whipped with an electrical cable. He was interrogated for up to 18 hours a day. First time they beat me, I was in the chair. He showed me the cable, and he started beating me all over my body. No one knew for the first two weeks in Syria where he had been removed because the U.S. government wouldn't tell people. 
Meher Arar was kept in a grave-like cell and tortured for over 10 months. He was then released and no charges were ever filed against him. I still have fears. I, I don't take the plane anymore. I don't fly. I have not been able to find a job. They ruined my life. They ruined my life. The idea that the president could simply pick up any person in the world and hold them in an offshore prison, hold them forever, is really a shock. And that goes against everything that a legal system or that a democracy or that a republic ever stood for. Wir haben ein deutsches Theater, einen deutschen Film, eine deutsche Presse, ein deutsches Schrifttum, eine deutsche bildende Kunst und einen deutschen Rundfunk. The next thing that always happened, the seventh step, is the targeting of key individuals. Goebbels was so good at this. He systematically targeted people who were not in alignment with the regime. So you start to see key individuals, visible individuals, kind of singled out to be punished or have repercussions, career repercussions. You saw people like the Dixie Chicks. The Chicks hit Travel and Soldier went from number one to oblivion in two weeks. Replacing it, Daryl Worley's Have You Forgotten, a pro-war song. It wasn't a local uh, type of thing where people, were, and, and there wasn't, an aspect of that, but for the most part, it was coming down from the top. You are not allowed to play the Dixie Chicks. One random comment, they wished Bush wasn't from Texas. Next thing you know, Clear Channel, which has close ties to the White House, is making sure that radio stations are not playing their music. We don't have a stage and a microphone. All we have is our checkbook. When we go pay for the CDs and the tickets and the T-shirts and all the stuff we pay too much money for. And then, another one of these echoes, you hear about spontaneous CD burnings of Dixie Chick CDs all over the South. And you know this, there's something funny going on with this because CDs don't burn. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is this echo? Book burnings, of course. In April of 1933, Goebbels orchestrated spontaneous book burnings where students were supposed to pile up books by people who were critical of the regime and trash them, set them on fire. You saw people like Dan Rather, a critical report of Bush's service. CBS News 60 Minutes and this reporter drew fire today over our reports that raised questions about President Bush's military service record. Subsequently, the White House put so much pressure on his employer that Dan Rather now claims in a lawsuit that his employers caved to White House pressure and, and, and drove him out of his job. The central thing here is you can't have freedom of the press if you're going to have large, big corporations and big government intruding and intimidating in newsrooms. The chilling effect of investigative reporting is going to be something we don't want to see. Many visible people, silent Valerie Plain. My name and identity were carelessly and recklessly abused by senior government officials in both the White House and the State Department. She was singled out to punish her husband, who had blown the whistle about the president's lie about yellow cake uranium. After a CIA-sponsored trip to Africa, her husband, Joe Wilson, wrote this article attacking the rationale for war, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Dick Cheney was furious, and when he found out Wilson's wife worked at the CIA, he wanted to use her to discredit him. It's claimed in retaliation, Scooter Libby leaked the fact that Wilson's wife, Valerie Plame, was a CIA operative. And you're convinced that's why they did it, is because they didn't like what you were saying? Well, I actually think that it was more nefarious than that. I think that they were doing it because they had every intention of trying to protect the cover-up of the lies and disinformation that provided the justification for war in the first place. They purposefully outed a CIA agent, Valerie Plame. That's not treason anymore, outing a spy? Did I mention it was one of our spies? <laughs> Did the July 14th column destroy your covert 
position and your classified status? Yes, it did. I could no longer perform the work for which I had been highly trained. And so that career path was terminated. It was her whole career. And her whole career depended on keeping the cover. And they deliberately went out and trashed her. Valerie Plame, her career ended, her life endangered, those of the people around her endangered. And she says in her memoir that when she went out on her back porch, to look at her back porch rather, she, and she has two toddlers, she saw that the bolts holding the deck up 20 feet off the ground had been loosened. That's right, targeting key individuals. The next step a would-be dictator always takes is to restrict the press. Of course, this is really scary, you know, to me, but it should scare all of us. There can be no excuse for anyone entrusted with vital intelligence to leak it, and no excuse for any newspaper to print it. Bill Keller, the executive editor of the New York Times, chose to publish a story that revealed that the White House, under the guise of fighting terror, was secretly and illegally monitoring financial transactions through a Belgian telecom company called SWIFT. Some of the press, in particular the New York Times, have made the job of defending against further terrorist attacks more difficult by insisting on publishing detailed information about vital national security programs. There was this drumbeat of sound bites from the White House, treason, treason, treason. Right-wing pundits and elected officials immediately called for the prosecution of the New York Times and its confidential sources under the Espionage Act. And I'm calling on the Attorney General to begin a criminal investigation and uh, prosecution of the New York Times. It's reporters, the editors that worked on this, and the publisher. Other pundits used White House sound bites that called for Bill Keller's prosecution on the basis of treason. Anybody who leaks or um, publishes classified data in a time of war in a highly successful program such as the SWIFT base, they should be uh, tried for treason. If they were found guilty of treason, I would have no problem with them being executed. There was this soundbite, prosecute such reporters under the Espionage Act. Prosecute reporters who release classified information under the Espionage Act. Well, anyone who works in journalism knows that up and down New York and Washington, good reporters are transmitting classified re information all the time because that's how they do their jobs. This is really scary when you've read the history of closing societies because what immediately comes to mind is that in 1936 and 37, Nikolai Bukharin, the editor of Izvestia, the equivalent of the New York Times in Russia, was charged with treason by Stalin. He was tried in a kangaroo court in the third Moscow show trial and was in fact executed. The Espionage Act of 1917 was passed in the run up to the First World War. The Espionage Act basically made it a crime to criticize the war. It equated dissent with espionage. And what it did was it allowed agents of the state to round up ordinary citizens, librarians, activists, labor leaders, journalists, without warrants. Often these people were beaten. They were imprisoned. Eugene Debs, a presidential candidate at the time, was sentenced to 10 years in prison under the Espionage Act. His crime, he had given a speech about the First Amendment. So this sweep of the Espionage Act silenced dissent in the United States for a decade. So when you start to hear this drumbeat, treason, treason, espionage, espionage, try them under the Espionage Act, you know that you have moved into a very dangerous place in a closing society. Bilal Hussein was an AP photographer. He was part of a team of photojournalists who were nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for their documentation of the, the war in Fallujah. Seized by the US military and held 
for over a year. The AP couldn't find out where he was, what happened to him, what the charges were against him. The charge was that he hung around insurgents. Let me tell you, as a journalist, you don't get the story without hanging around your subjects, right? That was a crime. He was practicing journalism. But in that time, if you're the head of the Associated Press and your guy's in custody, God knows what's happening to him, how tough are you going to be on the White House, right? You think it doesn't send a chill? Hussein has maintained his innocence, insisting he was only doing the work of a news photographer in a war zone. You could say, well, that's Iraq. But what if reporters here in the United States get threatened with jail for the crime of practicing journalism? Another really scary example for those of us who are journalists here at home is Josh Wolf, no relation. He's an American freelance journalist who was jailed by a federal district court for refusing to turn over a collection of videotapes he had made during a political protest. About two days after I filmed that protest, the FBI showed up at my house and asked a bunch of questions and wanted to obtain a copy of the full tape. Even after the FBI's subpoenas, Josh Wolf acted like a journalist and refused to turn over his sources. For this, he was sentenced to prison. I figured it would be the journalist spent the night in jail and they decided to drop the subpoena afterwards. This wasn't the case. You're taken by US Marshals from a courtroom, forced to strip down to absolutely nothing, handcuffs in the front, a chain around my waist tied to my feet. I remember seeing this very large guy, giant guy, shaved head, tattoos, looked completely scary as all can be. He's like, so what are you in here for? And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm a journalist that refused to uh, provide tape and testify before a grand jury about protesters. And he's like, so you're here for not snitching? That, that's, that's, that's amazingly cool, man. He's like, be sure to tell people about that. You'll get respect. You, you won't have anything to worry about. I'm like, all right, note to self, I'm here for not snitching. Josh served 226 days in an eight by 10 foot cell. His sentence was longer than that for any journalist in US history. The real risk, the real frightening fact was that the federal government was trying to obtain the identities of people who don't support what this government is doing. And using a journalist as an agent, a de facto agent to do it. When I was speaking to uh, intelligence officials about WMD in Iraq, they were willing to speak precisely because they knew that I would protect that confidentiality. And when you lose that ability to guarantee somebody's, um, to protect your sources, then you lose that information. Ultimately, it's the public as a whole that loses. The ninth step is to recast criticism as espionage and dissent as treason. And you see this more and more. Remember, uh, Senator Clinton criticized the Iraq war, and there was this drumbeat, treason, treason, treason. But you start to see in a closing society more and more laws criminalizing speech. Leave the Bill of Rights alone. Thank you. We already saw the White House use laws to silence dissent. If you're charged with the Espionage Act, you can be sent to prison for 10 years. So if you're charged with treason, you can be executed. But even scarier are new laws. One that's been passed redefines protest as terrorism. And another that's been proposed simply criminalizes free speech. At the Republican National Convention in St. Paul in 2008, 400 American citizens were arrested for protesting. 
Over a hundred were charged with felonies and dozens of reporters were arrested. Among those reporters arrested was Amy Goodman, journalist and host of the program Democracy Now! In a nearby park, there was a mass arrest of more than 200 people who weren't even part of the convention protests. You know, we knew that we hadn't done anything wrong. No one was really even holding signs. No one was really even demonstrating. We were all just hanging out. Out of nowhere, the police, the police tightened in, and everyone's kind of getting nervous at this point. And they just they get on the bullhorn and they say, "Ladies and gentlemen, you're all under arrest." Ladies and gentlemen, you're under arrest. Are you serious? I'm seeing families and like. You know, kids with University of Minnesota shirts and like, and, and at that point, no one really believed it. But then as they started slowly moving in, it became real clear that this was a mass arrest and that they were going to arrest people w without any, any probable cause, without any, witnessing any sort of crime other than hanging out in a park. Under the Minnesota Patriot Act, eight American citizens protesting the convention were later charged with terrorism. Get back. Okay. HR 1955, which blessedly hasn't passed so far, partly because we, we've been out there beating the drum about it. It was a bill with lots of support passed in the House on the way to the Senate, which would basically criminalize this conversation because it was so loosely worded that it criminalized any advocacy of the use of force against the government. Now, this is right out of Stalin's playbook. It was so loosely worded that if you say, as I'm going to say at the end of this, we need to investigate and prosecute anyone who's committed crimes in the White House, that's criminal. And it would implicate you, by the way, as being supporters of criminalized speech. And that is the, the hallmark of a closing society, because there's now an effort afoot to recast anyone who's critical of the state as a terrorist. Some members of Congress want to know why President Bush claims he can sometimes just ignore the law if he feels like it. This president's theory of his power is now, I think, so extreme that it's unprecedented. He believes that he has the inherent authority to violate federal law. Step 10 is the subversion of the rule of law. You saw it in Italy very clearly. Mussolini just started to ignore parliament. But Parliament kept saying, hey, we're Parliament. You can't just ignore us. Is this sounding familiar? Yeah. <laughs> so at this stage, you start to see what we're seeing now, which is Congress subpoenas Harriet Myers and Josh Bolton, and the White House says, sorry, too bad. So under the rule of law, that's contempt of Congress. And it's illegal, right? But Congress is like, no, 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 you don't understand. We're Congress. And the White House is whatever. The Attorney General scandal, the U.S. Attorney scandal. Remember that? There was a request from the White House as to the possibility of replacing all the United States attorneys. When I was first reading about it, there were eight or nine U.S. attorneys that had been targeted to be moved out. And I was reading Goebbels, so I thought, huh, I bet they tried to purge them all. And sure enough, the missing emails that we can't surface, they're gone, would show testimony proves that there was discussion about purging all the US attorneys at once. So why is this relevant? <clears throat> Again, in 1933, this very critical year, in one month, Goebbels purged all the attorneys and the judges, and he replaced them with his own guys. Once you do that, you can still have elections. You can still have a judiciary. You just don't have freedom.
The president, with signing statements, which he's used more than any other president, basically says, sorry, Congress, I don't care what you think. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Arlen Specter is holding hearings on Mr. Bush's use of something called bill signing statements. The president reserves the right to revise, interpret, or disregard a measure on national security or constitutional grounds. President Bush has done this 110 times to challenge 750 separate laws passed by the Congress. The signing statements represent a fundamental failure of the Congress to utilize its constitutional authority and the widespread practice has now come into play where the president signs and issues a signing statement undercutting uh, key provisions of the legislation. We're really at a point where the president is arguing about his own presidential power in ways that are in the antithesis of that constitution and the values that it contains. So at the last stage, you start to see this just flat out subversion of the rule of law or making it easier to declare martial law. Beginning in October, the Army plans to station an active unit inside the United States for the first time to serve as an on-call federal response in times of emergency. On October 1st, 2008, the president deployed a combat brigade from Iraq to the United States of America. Three to 4,000 soldiers will appear on American streets. Their mandate is to engage in quote unquote crowd control and to subdue individuals who are posing a threat to public order. This damage has been done to pull the last threads out, to make it look like a democracy, but make sure that essentially the pendulum cannot swing. Does the pendulum swing back? Can it? Will it? Well, unfortunately, civil liberties don't swing back like other issues. Uh, civil liberties is a very precious commodity. When you lose them, it tends to run out of your hand like sand, and it's hard to get it back. Once we lose these powers, once we lose these separation of the branches of government, no executive is going to voluntarily say, OK, Congress, you can have your power back. Citizens, you can have your power back. It's, you know, democracy is hard. And if you can intimidate the opposition, you know, what leader isn't tempted by that? This is the truth the founders knew. The window is closing, but it hasn't closed. And if we rise up together, there is no force on earth that can restrain us. law feels to me that it's been grievously injured in the aftermath of 9-11 and I hope that we're going to come to a time when we have some kind of a national commission uh, that will look back at what we've done and will begin to repair that damage. We as American citizens really should demand accountability. We, we should. We need to get the American people involved and educated and, and to have some knowledge as to how to vote and on what basis decisions are made. You know, maybe, yes, there are laws that need to be rescinded, but I really think it's more a matter of standing up and saying, you know, this is not who we are, and we're going to hold accountable, you know, those who did these things. If there's a movement around people who are infiltrated that says we will not accept this, then I think the doors will remain open because it will be seen as a political act that's part of a larger series of, resi of, of small resistances. Ultimately, I trust in the essential fairness of the average American to recognize that some bad things have been done and to recognize that we need to change what has been done in the last few years. We lost our way. We just need to find our way back to the path that served us well for so long and served our forefathers so well. Jefferson and Franklin categorically believed that 
It wasn't just Americans' right to criticize the government. It was Americans' duty. The Declaration of Independence actually says you have a duty to rise up and overthrow tyranny and injustice. That is your responsibility as an American. And Benjamin Franklin, you know, knew it was up to us. I mean, he, there's this great story that he was coming out of the Constitutional Convention, and a woman asked him, so, what is it? You know, is it a, is it a republic or is it not a republic? And he said, a republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. It's a quote from Edward Abbey, and it says, a patriot must be ready to defend his country against his government. And I honestly feel that in many ways that's what I did. Amendment 25, section one. In case of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, Vice President shall become President. My name is Robert C. Byrd. I am a United States Senator, and I am an American. This is my Constitution. This is our Constitution. And this is how it begins. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. If this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dictator. <laughs>